In this topic, we've learned how to set up our multi-server architecture using Unreal Engine 4 and Spatial OS. We will then work on dynamic interest management and offloading our AI to another server. In order to be able to perform our interactions in the simulation, either a multi-threading or a multi-server architecture needs to be implemented. This is also suggested by Dave Ratty in a discussion on networking in Unreal Engine 4. While multi-threading would certainly affect server performance, it is not as scalable as multi-server architecture, as they would still be limited by the number of threads, while the number of servers we can network with each other is theoretically unlimited. When we talk about multi-server architecture, we mean the processing of a single simulation by multiple computers. This is also called distributed simulation. This is a separate term from shard-based technologies, where we connect multiple standalone simulations. There are several games that use this architecture, such as Star Citizen, which uses a version of this architecture called server meshing. Furthermore, there is the Elder Scrolls Online, with its megaserver technology, which is used to scale the number of players, but in multiple worlds. Finally, Mortal Online 2 plans to use it to scale the number of players in one world. This paper will use the publicly available Spatial OS technology from Improbable, as it already has a stable and production-ready version. We will now explain the basic terms and concepts related to its function. Workers perform operations related to the Spatial OS system. They can be server or client workers. The server worker is equal to a classic game server, while the client worker is equal to the classic client instance of the game. The Spatial OS simulation is perceived through three concepts. The world, entities, and components. The world is the source of canonical truth for the whole simulation. All the data we want to share between the workers must be stored in the entities. These are all the objects in the game. All entities consist of components that store data. So in short, we write logic to workers who use data from components on entities. This kind of architecture is needed because we want more workers to be able to access the data without communicating with each other. Spatial S provides two concepts for simulation distribution. These are layers and spatial load balancing. Layering is a concept in which groups of components are organized by workers to simulate the world. The following figure shows an example where at the top we have a layer that is responsible for the AI controller component, and under it a layer that is in charge of the physical simulation. Spatial load balancing is the division of one layer according to its spatial or geographical principle, so one worker cares only for components in a certain part of the world. It should be noted that spatial load balancing as a feature is not yet ready for production, and it is therefore not used in this paper. But its application would require minimal modifications. We will now explain some of the concepts related to simulation distribution. Authority is a concept in which only one worker has the right to write component data at a time. This is important for spatial load balancing, because there the authority often changes. This concept is called handover. Interest is a concept in which one worker requires reading component data. This concept allows clients to receive only information that is relevant to them. In the following source, we see an example of an area in the world where the worker is authoritative. It is marked with a solid line, and the area of its interest is marked with a dotted line. They overlap due to the need for handover of authority over the entity. Persistence is a concept in which data for all components is stored in a system image, or a snapshot so that the world can be rebuilt later. On the limitations and the maximum player count. Operations are an extremely important limitation for the Spatial OS system. It is any writing or reading of data. In 2019, a metric of 6 million operations was set, resulting in 6,000 players. This was achieved with Unreal Engine 4 or position-oriented networking. In real-world applications, with the already mentioned game Scavengers, 4,138 players were achieved in one place, but with very little interaction, so without weapons and the like. It should be noted that that was achieved with a new figure of 250 million operations, resulting in tests with 10,000 players at around 30 Hz. Finally, it should be noted that there is currently a limit on purchased servers of 200 players or connections, and this is a metric that will guide us in the design of the game and match functionality. There's some more additional useful information regarding Special OS. Special OS has solved some of the most difficult problems of distributing simulations, such as the distribution of physical simulations. Their solution also covers cases where there is an overlap of authority. Furthermore, the problem of large worlds has been solved. This is a problem with the type of data for storing players' positions on the server. 
the largest possible number with a floating point number of 32 bits is around 2 billion. And it is therefore only possible to define a world as large as approximately 20 squared kilometers. There are methods to alleviate this problem, such as shifting the origin of the world, but they complicate the development process. This problem is also addressed in Unreal Engine 5, where they use large world coordinates, which remove world size constraints, and therefore this problem will not be addressed in this paper. The World Inspector is a web-based tool for reviewing the state of the Spatial OS world. With it, we can see live what is happening on the set server and all the connected workers. It shows all entities, components, workers, and their interests, as well as what burden they are under. When implementing Spatial S in Unreal Engine 4, there are several other terms to pay attention to, or how they are translated into Spatial S terms, which can be seen in the following table. It is important to be familiar with the concepts of remote procedural calls and networked multicasts. A remote procedure call is a function that is called locally but performed remotely on another computer. A network multicast is a type of RPC that is called from the server and runs on it and on all connected clients. Finally, it is very important to know how to iterate when creating a game with Spatial OS. As can be seen from the given source, if we have made any changes that would affect the replication properties, we need to restore the schema before placing the game on the server. In this chapter, we will explain why it is necessary to manage the interest of game clients and through which methods we can achieve this. It is recommended that you install Spatial OS from this point forward. Do so by following the Get Started Guide. As a result of positional updates, we can't download data on all components at once because that would obviously be too much data. And after all, something happening on the completely other side of the map from the player is probably not relevant to him. Let's now look at the fundamental techniques of client interest management. This brings us to the first method we can use, which is the previously mentioned net cool distance squared. It is a sphere of interest placed at the client's position. It expresses the interest in an entity. It can be defined at the entity or class level in UE4 in the replication menu. Let's now take a look at one example. The following figure shows the configuration of the destructive terrain entity, which will be discussed in more detail later. Since we want this entity to replicate at 300 meters, it is necessary to convert it into centimeters, or 30,000 centimeters, and enter its square, or 900 million. As mentioned earlier, this is the core of the Unreal Engine 4 network driver. This query is converted into a Spatial OS interest query in the Spatial OS network driver. A slightly better example is given in the documentation of this method. So in the source, the visible distance for the player is set at 200 meters, while for vehicles it is set at 400 meters. The player we are observing is in the center. According to its original implementation in Unreal Engine 4, entities within a given distance are sent to the client at full frequency, which is undesirable due to the volume of networking traffic and the impact on processor performance. Furthermore, it is obvious that entities closer to the client are more important than further ones, and therefore more positional updates should be received from them. This is usually done by the accumulator in Unreal Engine 4, but it can be more granularly defined here using net cool distance frequency. It should be noted that this is a method that, if enabled, then applies to all queries and cannot be configured at a level of a singular query. To enable this method, we must be inside Unreal Engine 4. Click on Edit. Project Settings, and under Spatial GDK for Unreal, select Runtime Settings, and under Interest, we select the check mark on the Enable Net Cold Distance Frequency. Furthermore, this method needs to be configured. First, we define in which distance ratio we want the full frequency. This is the full frequency net cold distance ratio, i.e. at the value of 0 0.33 in full frequency, we will get updates of those entities that are one third of the set distance. This can be further configured in the interest range frequency pairs menu. In this example, we set it to get 15 updates per second at two thirds distance and seven and a half updates per second at full distance. For some entities, we want to always receive updates regardless of their position. This is done using a method called always interested. For this, the Unreal Engine 4 U property specifier always interested is used. It must be an object reference, so an actor or an object, or have a specifier replicated or handover. An example of this method could be performed over the team scores, for which we always want to know the status. The actor interest component is an Unreal Engine 4 component that can be added to any character. It consists of query lists and a net cold distance squared switch. It provides a way to deeply define interests. 
when a client has a controller with that component, the query list within it defines the data that the client receives. And therefore, we will not use the previously mentioned methods, but only this one. It should be noted that one character can have only one such component at a time. Thus, unlike the Unreal driver, which defines connection from objects to the user only once, this system allows us to define connections from the user to objects multiple times. Queries can be a single limitation or more limitations connected with a logical operator or or and. The following table shows a list of possible restrictions. We will mostly use the AND constraints, the sphere constraints, and the uActor class constraints, as well as the component class constraints. The component is added to the character by opening up the character's blueprints. Under the components menu, selecting the specified component and pressing the add key. This component allows us very similar modifications as those made for Battlefield 4. So we create separate queries for cars, planes, and infantry. In the following image, we have configured a component on the player controller to receive updates from only those characters that have the test tag component on them and are within a sphere of 200 meters. This component was developed because some details of the character are not put into components, but into variables. For example, the team to which a character belongs to is a simple variable with a team identifier, but we cannot use component variables to identify them in constraints or in a schema. So the tag component or tag solves this problem because the components can be modified in a live environment, added to or removed from any character and used to identify interests. While the character interest management component is very useful, it is not dynamic. That is, it cannot be modified during gameplay. Because of this, for example, it would not be possible to change the interests in the enemy team if the client changed the team. Furthermore, the optimizations for the field of view would also not be possible. In order to be able to dynamically change the interests of our client workers, it is necessary to first study how the interest is initialized. This was a long process of studying the operations of the code itself, and the functionality of each part of the special OS driver was studied in depth. The solution lies in two classes. These are the special net driver and the spatial sender. The solution itself looks like this. So on the client worker, we must first define the constraints. These are the player bubble ends and the player bubble component and the relative sphere. We then add them to the interest component. Furthermore, we need to get the spatial S network driver from the world and get a link to the worker himself. In this case, the variable sender. Here, we call the function update interest component, which allows us to update the interests. This all has to be done on the server, i.e. if you want to activate the change from the client, we need to do an RPC. In order to perform interest queries based on the client's field of view, we need to create a sphere of interest in front of the client and move it accordingly. The size of the sphere should depend on the client's resolution. The ideal place to implement this is in the definition of the character controller itself, i.e. the GDK player control class. We will use the set control rotation function. It is called every time a rotation update is received on the server side, which saves us an unnecessary RPC. It should be noted that with this modification, we have left the driver system, and it needs to be optimized. We do this with a simple counter that performs the function to change the interests only after 60 cycles. This is done because changing interests is a demanding operation for the server processor. This implementation consists of initializing the constraints in the constructor and updating them in the query function. We must first calculate the center of the sphere of interest, that is, where the user is looking. It should be mentioned that this does not take into account the user's resolution, and this is something that should be updated in further iterations. After this, we have to update the constraint and add it to the interest component. It is a simple spherical and class constraint within the AND constraint. Finally, we call the previously shown update of the interest component. The image on the left shows the inspector. A visible sphere of interest is covering the client's field of view, about 100 meters in front of his location. When another character enters the client's field of view, he is replicated. Concerning future iterations, the idea is to use all of the presented methods to create the most efficient replication model. We will divide the interests of each client according to the following aspects, the field of view and the proximity, so a sphere around the client. The values are set with the intention of maintaining the best possible experience for the client, so that the entities that are the closest and in the field of view are refreshed as quickly as possible, as performed in Battlefield 4. The following table gives an overview of the frequency at which an entity will be refreshed depending on its distance in the client's field of view. The following table contains the average number of clients per field. We cannot influence these values. 
They are the result of the movement of the clients throughout the world. This is only an estimate based on gaming experience. It is assumed that the greater the distance, the more players there are, and that there are more players in the vicinity of the client than in his field of view. The result is an average of 1,488 other players in the field of view and in the proximity of the client. When we multiply these two tables, we get the total number of interactions per client. We get a total of 3,296 interactions per client. This number can be further reduced by updating the enemy team under full load, given in the first table, while our team is updated at half the rate. This is done with the previously performed tax system. The result is 2,472 interactions per client. If we take into account the possible 6 million operations per second, we reach the theoretical maximum number of players given this fidelity. This gives us 2,427 players. It should be mentioned that this prediction does not take into account projectiles, physical objects, etc. On the other hand, operations are not an ideal metric because they are the average possible number of operations from improbables testing, which is not their fault because it is generally difficult to estimate the average fidelity of environments. Furthermore, it depends on the number of servers available and their performance. Further optimization is possible, where we could dynamically change the update rate according to the number of players or physical objects with which an individual player interacts, but one could argue that the accumulator does a good enough job on its own. AI is an excellent candidate for placement on its own layer, as it is very expensive to process but latency tolerant. In order to configure our world or map with this layer, we need to create a configuration, i.e. a new class that inherits the spatialist multi-worker settings. A tutorial on this is available in the specialized documentation on offloading. We will configure it in two layers. The first layer is the default layer, which will be configured to handle all classes that could appear in the game, or all actor classes. For now, due to the unavailability of spatial load balancing, we will use the strategy of one worker or single worker strategy. The second layer, called AI Takeover, will be used to process the AI and include its spawners and controllers, and will use the same strategy. After compiling this configuration, we can edit the map. Open the map you want to configure and open the world settings menu. Here we enable layers using enable multi-worker and select our configuration under multi-worker settings class, where we put the previously created class. And now it's time to celebrate since you're running a multi-server architecture. In order to be able to keep track of the AI, we will use the previously mentioned spawner. It will take care of all the functions on the server side. So creating the AI, take control over it, and giving it commands. For the purposes of this project, the spawning of AI is done at the request of the client by pressing the B key, which is visible in the player controller class. Here we use an RPC on the server side to find all the spawners. There is only one, and call its spawn function. A player ID variable is also sent so that we can uniquely identify him. So here the spawner calls a function which finds the player and creates the AI in the world. Furthermore, a controller is created for the AI, which then controls it. And finally, a variable is set to control the behavior of the AI in the decision tree, so that the AI knows who to follow. The decision tree itself is very simple. The assigned character is followed. AI is only in the game to improve its flow, not to directly increase the interactivity, because interaction with the AI has much less meaning. Other players are responsible for the real interaction. The course of the game is improved by players taking control over the AI. In most other games, death means waiting for respawning. This can take from 30 seconds in squad to a few seconds in Call of Duty. All this time is actually spent on useless waiting. People want to play the game, that's there at the respawn menu. There is no dead time in our game. We can return to the game immediately by taking control of the AI. We will achieve this through layer design. Notice that we only put the AI controller on the layer, not its character. It is important that the character is on the same layer as the client controller, because this way we avoid unnecessary internal communications between layers. Although they are actually very secure and happen almost immediately, it is better to put this risk on the side of the AI controller than on the player, because his experience is obviously more important to us. The process itself is again started by the user, who by pressing the V key sends the RPC to the server, where it again searches for the appropriate AI spawner and activates its function to take control of the AI. In the spawner, we again find the appropriate player who requested the function. When we find him, we find the first available AI character, unpossess it, and do the same with the player. In the end, we just replace the possession, so the player now controls the character from the AI, while the AI controls the character from the player. We have now created a solid foundation of performance that will ensure we can add more fidelity to our simulation. If you would like more details on this topic, a wiki article is available in the description. 
Next week we will take a look at vehicles as one of the most complex networking cases and take a quick look at physics to ensure they are ready for a fully dynamic environment. Thank you for watching.